Welcome to the Maine Science Podcast. I'm Kate Dickerson. Today's episode is a conversation I had with Daniel Moore, the department chair of the Biological Sciences Department at Southern Maine Community College. Daniel has had a wide variety of science experience, and it was great to learn more about his passion for teaching. I feel like our conversation just scratched the surface of science at community colleges, and I appreciate Daniel's enthusiasm about his work and willingness to share with me. Our conversation was recorded in June 2024. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Daniel, welcome to the Main Science Podcast. It is a delight to have you here. We have crossed paths a bunch of times, starting with the Main Science Festival, I think, years ago. This year, you had one of the coolest hands-on activities, which I will circle back to. But mostly, I want to know how you ended up in science and in Maine. I know your bachelor's was way on the other coast there in Oregon, and I'm, I'm a little curious about where you grew up and how you ended up in science. Okay. I say that I'm an Oregonian, although my family moved around a bit when I was young. So I actually have some Southern roots. I was in Oklahoma and Texas, Colorado, but we ended up in Oregon in my formative years. So I like to say that I'm from the other Portland. And my mother has kids in both Portland. So she'll tell people, I have a kid in Portland and Portland. But I went to University of Oregon because there was a smaller program, an honors college, so that you could have a small liberal arts college experience while being at a big university. And that was great because there was an emphasis on writing, which is a skill that I'm still working on. <laughs> I think all of us are trying to be better and better writers in this kind of profession. So that was where I started out. And I actually started thinking that I was going to do film studies because I was really interested in the arts and really interested in film in particular. Like I would go see well, basically any movie I could go see for cheap, I would go and see it because I, I absolutely loved film. But somewhere in there, it was my chemistry class that was the most challenging. It was really, really difficult for me. And I don't know what it is in my nature that made me say, I got to learn more about this. I got to take on the challenge. Probably it was the hands-on part, like we were in the lab doing cool stuff, moving beakers and pouring this from here to here and getting data and analyzing it. And that was really appealing to have that hands-on part and yet at the same time really be thinking about it like it was a big puzzle that you had to solve. So the film studies program might have kept me if they'd like put a camera in my hand the first day. <laughs> but back then, cameras were not in everybody's phone. <laughs> there. They were a more expensive piece of equipment, and that wasn't how that program started. So I ended up shifting over to the sciences. I'd always liked science, but there's an artsy side of me that thought that's what I'd do for a living. It's super interesting that chemistry is what grabbed you, because so many people, I think, have a really difficult time with chemistry because you can't necessarily see what's happening. You know, you have to really observe and make inferences. I mean, I have a degree in chemistry. I love it. And most people's reaction to that is like, ugh. So I'm glad I found a chemistry ally, number one. But number two, it is really interesting because it's not like you have to take it on faith to see what's going on, but it's a different type of observation than a lot of other intro classes with physics where you're taking physical measurements or with biology where, you know, you might be dissecting something. That's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the equipment, the burette, and I don't know, there was just a lot of equipment that I really liked handling. And yeah, you're right. You don't get the answer immediately. The gratification is not quite as fast, but um, I don't know. I stuck with it. And that was the professor who was the most challenging for me. So. so what made you go from chemistry to biology for your PhD? Well, it was a long and winding path. At University of Oregon, I ended up in the biophysics, the biophysics lab for undergrad research. So I was headed that way a little bit. And the molecular biology classes have a lot of chemistry in them. Biochemistry had a lot of interesting problems too. So I was already kind of headed that way. But I still had that side that liked the arts and humanities just as much. So I have kind of an odd degree. I have a master's in liberal arts. I went to a college in Annapolis, Maryland. And this is how I ended up on the East Coast. It's a little college that has a great books program. So they have a graduate institute at St. John's College. So you would read a text like Plato's Dialogues. And then you didn't go hear a lecture about it. You would sit down in a room and discuss it with your colleagues. The teacher was called a tutor in those classes. 
and they would ask the opening question. And they did a lot actually to guide the conversation. They would keep asking questions, but mostly it was your classmates who had also read it, giving their point of view and asking each other questions and listening to each other. So I got a couple of years of that as well before I went on to do biology. But during that time, I was working at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine in one of the labs there. And the job that I found during the daytime was in a biology lab. We were doing yeast genetics. So again, genetics, kind of like chemistry, is very analytical, a lot of logic and math and probabilities. So I think that had the same kind of appeal, even though you're handling living organisms rather than working with chemicals. I'm curious if your master's degree helped you with your PhD research from the perspective of talking to other people and collaborating and questioning things. One of the other great misconceptions that continues to exist about science and research is that it's, you know, one person in a lab thinking things on their own. And that is so far removed from the truth at this point. I'm on a quest for people to realize it's a deeply collaborative exercise. And that's actually becoming even more collaborative because of interdisciplinary work. So I'm curious if you think that the approach of the great works or the great books ended up making you a better lab researcher. In the sense of thinking about communication and listening to people, it probably did. I can look back at it and see this is part of how I ended up on the track to work at a community college and really be focused on teaching because the liberal arts that background really helped with that side of things. Like, how do I explain this so everybody in the room gets what I'm talking about? Because our groups at St. John's College were really interesting. We had someone who had a business in one of the classes. We had another person who was a poet on the side. So we'd really read the same text and come at it completely different directions. She would be asking, okay, we're reading this book by Darwin. Why does he always capitalize nature? Which is something I didn't even notice. <laughs> So it really helped me to realize people come at things from really different directions and really look at them differently. I think it really is true. And part of the appeal of science is that you are part of a greater enterprise where your work has a place to fit with other people's work. And that's part of the process is reading what they've done, thinking about how you can do the next step. You're building on other people's shoulders all the time in a way that liberal arts maybe isn't as much. You have people come through, write amazing philosophy, and then everybody else after that is kind of deriving from that or trying to understand it better. And then another genius comes through and sweeps through the field. Whereas science has an aspect where you're building on what has been done again and again and again and finding your piece. And every little piece adds up to a, a much larger whole. That was awesome. The best description I've had yet of how integrated science is, right? I mean, it really is this generation after generation after generation of people building on it. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit because you've already alluded to it. You did your PhD work at MIT, which is great. And I'm sure that gives you a certain cachet and union card, which is well-earned and deserved and pretty cool. And then I know you did some research, but you specifically just said it got you ready your master's degree helps you teaching at a community college. I'm curious about how does someone who does their graduate work at MIT, which certainly oftentimes creates a path that is very either hugely academic focused or hugely corporate research focused, somehow decide, you know what I really want to do is go teach at a community college and why? It's a little bit of a fork in the road that most people do not take. Yeah. So I did a little bit of research in industry. I did research in nonprofit. I did research, you know, as a graduate student. And through all of it, I love research. So I could have kept doing that. But I think in conversation with a few people, I realized that my favorite part was training new people as they came in the lab. I just enjoyed that moment of showing them something and then having them do it and talking through you said chemistry, you do a lot where you don't really know what you're doing. It's clear liquids, you're moving from here to here. Molecular biology is even more so. You're moving tiny amounts of this enzyme into a tube with a clear liquid. And the steps where you actually see that you've done something are even more infrequent. So I enjoyed that process of like talking it through, helping them visualize what's happening in the tube. And again, handling things, but also showing people how to handle those objects and get the desired results. 
I don't know. I guess I've just always been a teacher because I think back and realize even in grad school, I was the one in the lab when people would say, oh, go ask Daniel how to do this. Daniel can show you. It just often got pushed to me because I enjoyed that process and I like to think that I'm good at it. Well, I've seen you in action with hands on and it's pretty clear to me that you're good at it. So let's do a day in the life or a month in the life of Daniel as a community college instructor. I'm going to hazard a guess, and please correct me if I'm wrong. You have a very diverse set of students. You've got kids who are just out of high school and may or may not be totally ready for lab work. But I'm going to bet you also have a significant number of people who are going back to school. And in those two populations, some will be interested in going on and pursuing further education in science, and others are probably taking your class because it's a prerequisite and they just want to be done with it. So that's four different audiences within a classroom that you've already got that you have to teach and reach them. And I'm sure there are other audiences. So how do you figure out how to engage? How do you help each one of those succeed? And no pressure here to answer any of those questions. (laughs) As I'm saying this, I'm like, how do you make everybody the best? So I think it's a difficult job to teach anyway, but to have a very diverse audience within that classroom, more so than maybe at a university, is really interesting to me. I like teaching at community college because of that diversity, and it actually takes care of some of the things that you're talking about. When you have a student who already has a master's degree in business, and they're sitting next to a student straight out of high school, if you can create the atmosphere where they talk to each other, it's great for that student right out of high school to hear like, okay, one day you're going to have a job and this is what it's going to be like. You're going to have to hand things in on time. You're going to have to do this. You're going to have to do that. Yeah. So the diversity is actually an asset that you have different people coming from different phases of life, all trying to learn together. I think the most important thing in a classroom is kind of mundane in a way, being really organized. I try to make it super clear what's expected, when it's expected, so that we can free up time and energy for really learning the material and really playing with the things in lab, if we have a lab. I think that's the most important thing. And I would say across the board, the faculty in the biology department at SMCC really look for that. Like we think students doing research and trying things, trying to answer questions that maybe haven't even been answered is really how you learn to love science and how you learn how the scientific process works. So as much as possible in classes, we don't have the recipe cut and dried kind of labs. We try to have more and more of, okay, here's the question. Here are some tools. How can we get at this? What kinds of things can we do? And we also really, because of a few grants that we have, there's the Embry grant from NIH, National Institute of Health, that lets us collaborate with a lot of other institutes across the state, from Colby, Bowdoin, Bates to um, DIBL. So various institutions around the state that are doing research, our students are outplaced. They get to do internships at these places. And we do short courses where they get to travel and be at these places and experience research. Because that's really where the fun is as a scientist, is actually interacting with other researchers and doing the science, doing the experiments. Yeah, I was going to ask, when you say you're able to do research with your students, is that In the context of a laboratory course where they're kind of duplicating or learning how to do experiments that other people have already done, or do you also have an opportunity for students to do original research? Yes and yes. So we have three programs. We have a program in biotechnology, and we have a program in marine science. So one of them is a little more focused on indoor research, and the other one, you go outside and you collect samples, and then you bring it indoors, and you do a lot of the same things. So both of those programs, the students take a lot of different classes. The other thing that we have a lot of students are pre-health science students. So they're going to do anatomy and physiology, and they're going to do microbiology with us. So if I focused in on one class, I would say in microbiology, it's not unusual. It's pretty standard to gather and learn all the tools and techniques to differentiate between types of bacteria. And then ultimately, they're given a little beaker that has broth with two different species in it. And they need to separate those two bacteria and then run the tests to figure out, okay, which species did the professor give to me? And that's a defined kind of original research. They don't know the answer and everybody has a different mixture. So it's a chance to really see like, okay, I'm going to use science to find an answer here. 
find out what I've been given. So the biotech program, we focus a little bit more on internships, getting students to work at places so they can make connections. And that's building a job network if you're out there. Maine is small enough that everybody kind of knows each other. So you can find a job, even if that company doesn't have one, you can find one somewhere else. And the marine science program has several courses that are really focused on research techniques and answering questions. Using a boat, we have a research vessel. And so students are able to go out on the water, collect samples, um, gather data, and then come back in and answer questions. And right now, the program ends for most of the students with a capstone research project that is in-house research. So they come up with a question, and then with some guidance from the instructors, they'll try to do the experiments and arrive at an answer. These are short research projects. They're really just meant for a poster. Rarely does it turn into any kind of publication. But it is a chance to have that experience of asking a question, making a hypothesis, gathering the data, analyzing it, and then seeing if you support or refute the hypothesis. So I know you're the chair of the biological sciences, but it sounds to me like the liberal science studies program and the biotechnology program are more in line with your expertise. Do I have that correct? That's true. Yeah. Okay. Do you ever have to kind of go way over your skis and do anything with marine sciences? And I assume you have faculty that do that as well. But I'm curious, because those areas of science are so different, how much at a community college do you have to know about all of them, as opposed to you can stick with your expertise in one area? Yeah, well, as the chair, I can choose what I want to teach and then have to kind of fill in if we can't hire somebody. But yeah, I couldn't jump in and teach phycology. Like, I don't know enough about algae and seaweeds to teach that class. But I walk by the lab, and if there's something interesting going on, I'll drop in to see what they're looking at, what kind of seaweed they're pressing, and ask the students, like, oh, what is this one? What is that one? You know, with the instructor's approval, of course. Because as a scientist, you are driven by a kind of curiosity. Like, there's really no limit to what you want to know. So I won't remember the names of the species, but I'll certainly remember something I might learn about characteristics of seaweed or the ways that you preserve it and study it. So I'm glad that we have something completely different. So I can step out of my comfort area and and keep learning. My expertise would be more in genetics, molecular biology, cellular biology. How much are you able to explain how much you enjoyed the research to your students and have them get that it's really cool, even though you yourself are no longer doing it as your primary job? Yeah, I don't think they think about it very much. (laughs) That's fair. They just know that I've done research and part of teaching science is humanizing it like you're doing by doing this podcast, helping them to realize that it was people who did this. So I don't want to take up too much of class time, but I'll try to bring in stories about some of the researchers and some of the conflicts that researchers had. Like we talk about Watson and Crick, and then we talk about how some of their conclusions were based on data that they saw from another researcher. I mean, she didn't get a lot of credit, right? So you need to kind of wind these stories in a little bit. I'll even talk about a few people that I've met who were researchers that are in their textbook to help them realize like, oh, you know, this book was written about people who actually exist out there. And if you stay in the sciences, you're going to meet them at a meeting. You may sit down and discover that the person having lunch right across from you won the Nobel Prize for something. It's that accessible that if you stay in the sciences, you meet some of the brilliant people that your research is based on. That's a really great reminder that not just the stories of humanizing science, but that The fields are small enough that at a certain point, you will be in the same room with all of these folks and that perhaps it helps alleviate some of the imposter syndrome that people inevitably feel when they're younger. If they've heard that, this is how they started out and you could be there too. When I was younger, I was less willing to say things in a classroom or in a talk because I wanted to be right. I wanted to people to think I was smart. And now being on the other side, I realize oh my gosh, I want my students to be wrong. I want them to just answer. Just let me know where they're at, what they're thinking. It's the process that's a lot more interesting than the solution. Like, how do you ask questions? How do you think about things? Where are you at in thinking about this? What foundation of knowledge do you have? Even if I've talked about things, maybe you don't remember them. 
because none of us remember everything. So I guess as I've gotten older, I've fallen more in love with the process of doing science and thinking about it and cared less and less about the solution or even like a particular technique as a way to do this or that. Really, it's the questions that you're asking that are interesting. And I wish more students would ask me questions, even when I'm asking them a question, if they would ask a question back. That dialogue is really the best part of science, to be going back and forth and thinking about things. So that goes back to how you approached your master's degree with the reading, the questioning and the back and forth and coming at it from different angles. Yep. The way that we try to teach science, we cover so many things that you couldn't really drag out the original research articles and have students read them. And then we would discuss them and learn things that way. It's not really practical. There's very few like seminal works that you could have everyone read and then talk about and then start to understand the field. But yeah, certainly as much as you can bring that in, having it be a dialogue, having questions go back and forth. The ones that are really listening and thinking about it will ask me questions that are amazingly great. Like they're super fundamental. And I have to say like, gosh, I don't know. That's a great question. And I try to remember it and try to go look it up later. And I've learned a lot just by following up on student questions. First of all, I love that you're willing to say, I don't know. I think a lot of scientists, certainly younger ones, are like you were when you were younger, which is you don't say things because you want to look like you're smart, right? And saying, I don't know, is actually really important. But I think you have just totally encapsulated the value in many ways of what has been traditionally called a liberal arts education, in that you're just exploring and critical thinking. And in the context of science, it's not one that people often think about. I mean, as a totally separate aside, a really cool elective class might be what you said, like a couple seminal papers, and you just digest it as if you didn't know anything else. I would find that really interesting and really frustrating, I have a feeling, but a good class. So maybe someday you can get that out there. That was one of the best parts of my graduate school experience. We had a journal club. So every other week we were reading a paper and talking about it. I mean, we kept it pretty focused on our research area, but not always, because sometimes we go to a meeting and someone will come back and say, oh, we got to discuss this paper by this person. And it would be a little bit outside of fruit fly genetics, which is what I did. Okay. I want to, before I let you go, I want to circle back to what you did for the hands-on activity for the science festival this year. You got to talk to people much longer than you usually would, probably because of the snow that we had. <laughs> the brave many, not as many as possible, but like the sense I got from people who were doing hands-on activities was that you got to have real conversations with people because, you know, it wasn't as crowded as usual. And if I can find a picture, I will include it in this episode somehow. But it was really cool. It was a whole inside of the human body in this just riveting way. I was stunned at how much it cost when you and I talked about it at the festival. So I'll let you explain it and then we can dive into why it's so important for teaching and then why it is so expensive. Yeah. So it's a community college where I teach. We do a lot of anatomy and physiology. It would be great if we could have actual human cadaver, but that requires a lot more specialized licenses and lab space than we have. But I saw a cadaver at a meeting that I went to one time. And so there's a company that tries to make these synthetic cadavers. They're life-size on the smaller end of being, but they are life-size. And we looked at one with a more realistic material, but you have to keep it wet and it has a little tendency to grow mold. So we went with the one that's a little easier to maintain and it's made of silicone, but they cast the muscles individually. They have the organs made individually, and then it needs to be hand sewn together. So I think that's where a lot of the expense comes in. But it is the first one in Maine at an educational institute, our salesperson told us. So we're really lucky to have it because it is in the tens of thousands of dollars, almost a hundred thousand. But it's a great tool for students to look at. Instead of the hard plastic models that we typically use for anatomy and physiology, this one's softer. So you can push aside a muscle group and see what's underneath it. You can take the organs out of the abdomen so you can look at how long. That was the lesson that we were trying to teach to younger children at the festival is how long your intestines are. Like you pull them out and they keep coming and coming and coming. <laughs> Yeah, it's a crazy, I remember the first time I realized how long intestines were and thought that it's not possible that they all fit in there. Right. Which classes benefit from the Sindaver, right? I mean, I would imagine 
people who are studying nursing and other things. But, you know, like you said, you can move things around and really see what's going on in there. Yeah. Well, we have a lot of sections of anatomy and physiology because there's a lot of nursing programs. A lot of students get started at community colleges or they have a degree already. They realize they want to go into nursing. And community colleges are often a place people turn to to take that class that they need for the next step. Yeah, it's of benefit mostly to the anatomy and physiology students. They're the ones that we really had in mind by buying this endeavor. But we do teach general biology classes. So when they're, say, dissecting the frog, they could come in and take a look at it and see, oh, okay, this is what it would look like in a human. Interesting. So what surprised you most about this endeavor once you got it? Yeah. What was interesting is I never realized how large the psoas muscle is and how it really runs from posterior to anterior. And this way, it's a muscle that you use to jump like rabbits had a really giant psoas muscle because it runs from your back kind of internally to the front of your hips, being very approximate about it. And, you know, I'd read about it, I'd seen it in figures, and I knew it was there. But when you open it up and really start moving organs around, it's really like, oh, wow, what is that? Oh, that for me was the thing that really came home in a different way. Like, oh, wow, that's a giant muscle group that's really important. Have you thought about yours since you've seen it in this endeavor? Like, have you thought about when you're doing different motions that it's that muscle group? Sometimes. I think the funnier experience is talking to someone actually at the science festival who was a massage therapist. She was saying how hard it is to massage that muscle because it's kind of internal, but they do have a way to kind of get to it and give it a massage. The kids really love seeing a cendaver and they love touching the parts and kind of freaking out about it. But I was surprised we actually had someone come over and explain to her husband what kind of surgery was done on his shoulder by moving the muscles around and She's a surgeon, so she was actually telling me a little bit about some of the muscle groups. There's a little tiny muscle in the shoulder. She was calling it the lighthouse muscle because if you're on this side of it, it's pretty smooth sailing. You can make a few mistakes and not cause damage. But on the other side, there's some important arteries and nerves. So it's kind of like the lighthouse. You don't want to get on the rocks and go over to that side. That is so cool. Yeah, it was a really cool (laughs) moment. Like I said, science is back and forth. You put something out on display like you're the expert and you end up learning things by talking to people. Yeah. And surgeons, you know, as soon as you said that, I was like, they don't get a chance to show normal human beings what's going on when they go in there because you don't have access to a cadaver and most people aren't going to watch surgery. So that's actually a really cool thing to think about where if they had that at their disposal, kind of, they could really show it easier. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Daniel, this has been a joy to talk to you. I feel like you've educated me some. What happens at a community college? It's not been my background for sciences, applied sciences like this in particular. So I really appreciate it. I feel like we just scratched the surface. I really appreciate how willing you've been to be part of the festival and the field trip day and explaining and connecting the dots of what people learn in a classroom to what they can do otherwise and just making it accessible. I think it's a real gift and I'm really grateful you're able and willing to do that. Yeah, well, thank you for inviting me to be a part of your blog. And I absolutely enjoy going to the Maine Science Festival and being a part of it. I just wish it was closer to Portland, but otherwise. I know, you and a few other people, Daniel, but you know, we got to keep it accessible for those north of us, so. Centrally located, yeah, yep. if I understand. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Maine Science Podcast. Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing on your podcast platform of choice. And please leave a rating and review. It will help more people find us and help spread the word about some of the remarkable people doing science in Maine. The Maine Science Podcast is recorded at Discovery Studios at the Maine Discovery Museum in Bangor, Maine. The Maine Science Podcast is executive produced and hosted by me, Kate Dickerson, and edited and produced by Scott Lozell. The Discover Maine theme was composed and performed by Nick Parker.